Morning everybody, uh, welcome to the Observatory webinar this morning. This is our second uh, webinar, so uh, welcome. Uh, in uh, York today, uh, I'm Charles Lane and we also have... Chris Malumphy from Ferrer. And Melanie Manley. So we're all in uh, York and we have colleagues down at Alice Holt in uh, Forest Research and Forestry Commission if they'd like to say hello this morning. Hello, this is Anna Perez uh, from Alice Holt. Um, Lucy Turner. And Helen Carter from Forestry Commission. Hi, welcome there. So we're going to follow a similar format to last time. So we're going to start off with talking about uh, the current hot topic, which to no great surprise is the Oriental Chestnut Gall Wasp. Uh, so very much thanks to everyone, to the volunteers who went out and went surveying. That's been a huge result, so well done, everybody. Uh, and we're going to start off with uh, Helen Carter, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the situation and then hand over to Chris Malumphy to talk about some of the science aspects, and then we'll pick up any questions online. So, Helen, would you like to start? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear okay. We're having a bit of trouble with the volume earlier. Um, so please chip in if you need me to repeat anything. Um, I'll just give a quick summary of the work we've been doing over in Kent uh, recently with regards to the Oriental Chestnut Gall Wasp outbreak. Um, there's a bit of background. It's a pest that we've been surveying for in this country for about 10 years um, as part of, of the protected zone status that this country holds, uh, along with chestnut blight um, in sweet chestnut. And to date, nothing had been found until recently, in the middle of June, um, an amateur gall recorder who does volunteering work in the woodland in Kent, uh, detected some galls on sweet chestnut, which they suspected was similar to the oriental chestnut gall wasp and, and not being aware of any other galls that affect sweet chestnut. Um, a sample was sent up to Sarah, and it was uh, confirmed that it was indeed larvae of the oriental chestnut gall wasp. Um, that prompted then some survey work throughout the woodland, which Forestry Commission led on, and that involved assessing the trees that we already found with galls on for, for numbers and carrying out some wider transect survey work through the woodland, um, radiating out from the most heavily affected point. Um, those transects involved bringing down about 40, uh, 43, 45 stems of sweet chestnut and inspecting all of the foliage on each of those stems, which um, was quite a, a large task but undertaken over a matter of days. Um, we found trees ranging with gall content from just one on a, sing a single gall on one tree up to over 3,000 on another stool, so quite a range. Um, but that survey work allowed us to ascertain a, a, an approximate distribution of the galls from the trees that we'd looked at, and that then dictated um, or helped to, to inform the area which was going to be felled. It decided that felling work was going to take place to, um, I think it was unlikely that we were going to eradicate it, but certainly minimize as much as possible the number of galls that remained viable. Um, that felling work has since taken place, um, and the material, the, all the, uh, the foliage and, and the smaller diameter branches have all been mulched to, as much as possible, destroy the gall material. Um, all that time, we were taking samples and sending sample material back to Farah and to Alice Holt for analysis. Um, that brings us pretty much up to date on the situation in Kent. The wider survey work went on around the woodland and no other galls were found in any other woodlands in Sweet Chestnut in the area. And those surveys went out to about 10k radius around that initial woodland. Um, another site was detected completely separately from that survey in St Albans in Hertfordshire um, by an observatory volunteer. And those, that, that was a completely different situation. It was a residential street. So there was about, if I remember correctly, about nine mature sweet chestnut which were felled um, and destroyed as well. Um, and at the moment, going forward, in terms of monitoring, there's now a network of sticky traps out in the Kent Woodlands which are positioned around the felled area and out further into the woodland as well to try and monitor any, um, any presence of adults adult gall wasps throughout the emergence period, which is, is running probably six to eight weeks, something like that. Um, that's, I think, the situation as it stands. Unless I've missed anything crucial. Happy to take any questions on that. Thanks very much then, Helen. I think what we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll then move on to Chris, if that's okay. Just give us an update, and then we'll take questions at the end, if that's okay. Yep, sure. Okay. Helen's covered the situation very well. 
um, from the Ferrer Lab um, sort of observations, we, we had received in excess of 3,000 galls, and we have been monitoring uh, what's emerging from the galls. And so we're having the oriental chestnut gall wasp adults emerging in the lab. They're relatively small numbers of emerging, so, and it, it's likely that the peak adult emergence won't occur until t the sort of end of July. This is a approximately a month later than observations made in Italy, for example, which is what you'd expect because of the um, difference in climate. All of the, we've, we've had um, 20 traps submitted last week and the week before. These are the sticky traps to monitor the adult emergence in Farningham Wood in Kent. And so far, over the last two weeks, we haven't picked up any adults emerging in the field. But we are picking up lots of native gall wasps. So the traps are working effectively in the field. And the fact that we're not picking up the oriental chestnut gall wasp adults on the traps suggests that we have been successful in uh, at least um, suppressing the numbers of adults that are active and emerging in the woodland. This, will, of course, will help with containment. Um, we've also made some very interesting observations on the levels of parasitism. So in a sort of natural situation where you have a balance between these little tiny parasitic wasps that attack the native gall wasps, you would normally expect to get less than 2% par rates of parasitism. Um, in the oriental chestnut gall wasp populations in Farningham Wood, we've been getting an average of around um, 25 to 30 percent parasitism. So this is um, unusually high. But th th this is what you would expect when you have a new outbreak and things haven't sort of got into a natural balance yet. Um, and we've reared um, over 200 adult parasitic wasps. There are there's a whole suite of parasitic wasps already attacking the oriental chestnut gall wasp. These have actually been locally recruited, uh, or we suspect they're locally recruited, and, and they've switched from attacking oak gall wasps, native oak gall wasps, to attacking the introduced chestnut gall wasp. Um, these uh, adult wasps, we can identify them to species groups morphologically, but to actual species, we, we really need to um, sequence them and look at their DNA to identify them accurately. So that's uh, something that's ongoing. So um, as Helen's mentioned, um, the trees that were infested in St. Albans have been removed, um, and the vast majority of trees that, that were infested in Farningham have also been removed. So it, we're, we're hopefully, we've certainly suppressed the numbers of chestnut gall wasp, um, to, to stop it sort of spreading further in Kent to other sort of coppiced woodland. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Do we have any general questions either for Helen and Chris from the volunteers? Uh, yeah, um, this is Adam in uh, Welling Garden City. Um, um, question on: Is there um, before the, the trees were felled, was there a notice, noticeable difference in the sort of the health or vigour of the trees? Um, the, th the one with 3,000 on compared to the one with uh, just a handful. I'd like to take this one, it's Helen here. Hi, Adam. Um, Hiya. Not noticeably. Um, obviously, we didn't know the woodland in detail before this happened, so we didn't have a, a view of the trees, sort of, you know, months, years previously. But certainly the, the, the managers of the woodland weren't aware of any noticeable decline. Um, and actually at this time of year when the ghouls are basically the same colour as the leaves, it's actually very difficult um, to see them from ground level. The one in the area of heavy, heavy infestation, they were obviously more obvious because they were visible at ground level um, on lower foliage as well as, as upper foliage, but certainly throughout the rest of the woodland on trees that had fewer numbers of ghouls, it, it wasn't obvious by any stretch, no. Okay, thanks. The, the, the trees are about 30 years old, so they were, they were quite large and very high canopy. Um, so that was, and, and from my understanding, understanding the uh, St Albans trees as well were mature and pretty massive. So assessing the canopy from the ground would, would well, be very difficult, which is uh, why the decision was taken to, to fell stems in the trees that affect the upper foliage more readily. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Helen. Do you have any more questions?
Can I ask something? Is Anna here from Alex Hall? Yeah, yeah, go for it, Anna. <laughs> Just to Chris. Uh, Chris, you and you, uh, you said you, you have these traps. You are looking into them now. Uh, do you do the identification by morphology, or do you uh, do by DNA by sequencing? No, the the oriental chestnut gall wasp mm -hmm. can be identified accurately just using morphological characters alone. When I was okay. talking about the DNA, this is really for the um, the parasitoids, the parasitic wasps that attack. Okay. The so what we're doing with the sticky traps, um, we're screening the sticky traps under low power uh, in the laboratory. And unfortunately, it's not straightforward because we do have British gall wasps, which are associated with oak, which are very similar. So we have to use uh, white spirit to soak individual adults or specimens off the traps and then look at them more critically under high magnification to, to confirm the identification. But we can do it morphologically. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. Do, do we have any indication whether it was an introduction this year or it's uh, been here for more than one year? Do we know that yet, Helen? Um, I don't know if it's been point, pinpointed to a particular year, but certainly some old ghouls have been found. Um, the um, ghouls in autumn time turn a quite a brown, sort of woody texture to them. Um, and some of the feedback from the sample material we collected was that there were some small, very small old ghouls attached to some of the twigs and actually very difficult to distinguish from the twigs because they'd shriveled and shrunken so much. Um, so, I mean, the presence of, of old ghouls would suggest that it's, it's not arrived this year, but actually pinpointing which year, uh, I don't think, well, nobody has and we, I don't know if it's possible. Can I just add to that, uh, Helen, because we, we, with the samples that we received at the lab, we have an example of, from St. Um, Albans and from Farningham Wood of old ghouls from last year, which would suggest that the wasps have been present, in fact, at both sites since 2013, but we don't have any evidence prior to that. So it appears that, we, that the, the, the wasp has been present at both sites for two years. That's really helpful. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, does anybody have any more questions on uh, oriental chestnut gall wasp before we move on? Okay, right, we'll move on. So uh, we've had some uh, questions uh, submitted. Uh, so one of the questions that um, has been submitted is around uh, when carrying out biosecurity uh, procedures, when you've washed all your boots and done all your decontamination, there was a question raised about what you should then do with the uh, wash water once you've scrubbed your boots and equipment. Uh, Helen, is that something you can provide some guidance on? Yeah, sure. Um, essentially, the, the, to clarify, um, the, the idea is to leave all the material on site um, in terms of, of boot water. Um, avoid uh, uh, disposing of the water down, down drains just so that it, it keeps it out of the water courses. Any waterborne diseases can obviously be spread further that way. So um, once you've uh, finished <coughs> excuse me, washing your footwear and, and cleaned out your bucket, dispose of that on a on a the verge or, or grass or something um, away from the road or away from the track um, so that the material stays on site afterwards. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Helen. I hope that answers the, uh, the question quite clearly. And then uh, the other question we had about uh, was uh, people interested to know what was coming uh, through tree alert uh, and what were some of the sort of uh, topical pests and diseases. So I think uh, Anna's got quite a nice presentation she's just going to talk us through, if that's okay, Anna. Okay, thank you, Charles. Yes, um, I've been preparing this. I mean, Lucy has been done part of the preparation, and I have done part of it. Um, yes, we, we have, this is the report for the first uh, three months, uh, from April till June, the end of June, and we have over 200 um, uh, new uh, tree alert reports. Um, it's quite a lower number in comparison to last year, although the trend that you can see on that graph, it actually is, it follows quite well the trend from last year. 
but we the number of reports that we have in comparison is a bit lower. Uh, but as I said, we have um, over two, 200 reports. And um, what we thought is just to maybe um, highlight, you know, the different uh, reporting lines and maybe to have the number of trial reports by reporting lines. Then obviously the highest number of trial reports are general reports. Um, then obviously the next the next one um, is a, a report the report line for Calara. Then you will see we have the next one is the non Calara. These are the cases uh, where the reporter suspect Calara comes to the reporting line and halfway through the system will detect that actually the symptoms are not consistent or the host is not uh, ash and then basically they will be sent to the general reporting line. We have no suspected reports of phytophthora lateralis. We had a couple of a AOD but we have lots, I mean in comparison nine that they suspected AOD but they were the same as with Calara that they come to the AOD reporting line and um, halfway through they will be sent to the general reporting line because either the, sim the symptoms are not consistent. I think probably on this one the host was correct, uh, but maybe the symptoms were not consistent. We have uh, one DMB, um, Dofistroma needle blight, two suspected cases of uh, Asian long form beetle, and we have 10 request uh, diagnoses. If we look to the total number of volunteer trial reports by reporting line, then we have uh, 17 of them, they were just uh, general reporting lines. Um, we have seven, um, they were uh, Calara, to, they came through the Calara reporting line. Um, we had two that they were actually not Calara. Uh, one AOD, we have seven uh, that they were no AOD. We have one uh, ALB, Asian non home beetle, and one request uh, diagnosis. Um, what I wanted to, to show is also just to give an idea of um, what kind of inquiries or what trees are, are coming through. Uh, obviously, the top 10 holes from April till June, um, ash obviously is the main one. Uh, followed by oak, and then um, followed by uh, chestnut. Then we have cedar, then horse chestnut, then we have beech, plane trees, pine trees, elms, and spruce. And just the final slide is just to, to show the top 10 pathogens that we have been confirming in, the, in these first three months. Um, and quite interesting, you will see the first one is uh, Apiognomonia veneta. This is a plain anthracnose, and this year uh, almost every plain tree that we find in the country, I think it has been affected. I, I'm not sure if the volunteers are know this disease. This is, is, um, this is a fungus disease that can affect the leaves, the shoots, and the buds of the plain trees. And if you look carefully, as I said, almost all the plane trees, especially around the south, are all affected. Um, the second most important problem we have is Pseudococcus. And Pseudococcus is a fungal pathogen that is affecting cedar trees, and that means true cedars, um, Cedrus atlantica, especially uh, Cedrus atlantica glauca. The third most uh, common inquiry that we have is honey fungus. The fourth is uh, Phytophthora root disease. Then we have Dutch elm disease. The following one is uh, Cryptoclinic taxicola. This is a, a fungal um, pathogen that affects uh, yew trees and it causes browning of the foliage. And some of the branches will be um, it's just patchy, you will see on the yew trees, just brown pa uh, patches of foliage, and this is a fungus that affects the, the needles. Then the next one uh, is Calara, 
Hymenos kyphus fraxineus, followed by uh, powdering mildew on uh, oak, Edisifi uh, alphitoides. Then we have Eutipa lata, that it was also on ash. And then uh, I also add one Tafrina pruni, that is uh, what we call pocket plum. That is a, a problem on uh, plum trees. Uh, it's a kind of uh, fungal gall that is uh, created on the, on the plum. Um, I think we have nothing else from, to report from tree alerts. I don't know if you have any other questions or any questions regarding um, all this. Uh, welcome to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Have we got any questions from the volunteers about Anna's presentation? Can I ask a general question, Anna? Would you say the results you're seeing this year are similar to previous years, or there are, are there any particular pathogens um, that you're finding more commonly this year? Definitely a plain anthracnose, definitely. Last year we had no reports of plain anthracnose, and this year is the main one. I mean, we have, we have it, as I said, through the phone, we have phone calls, we have um, samples coming in, and last year we had no cases. Obviously, this is a good year for uh, plain anthracnose. And the other one that is in the increase is Cida uh, blight caused by Cirococcus. And this is a problem that is a new fungus that we identified. It was described in 2008 in a state. And the first detection in, the, in Britain was last year. And it's in the increase. Um, then we really we are working on this problem here at Alice Holt. And um, we are very interested if you see, for example, any, any uh, cedar trees that they are showing a shoot blight or die back uh, to send samples or to report it to us. The other ones are malaria, phytophthora, adaptation disease are similar to other years. The other new one is cryptocline taxicola that is causing this uh, needle blight of dew trees and that as well. We had, uh, it started last year and it's on the increase as well. The other ones, I think they are the common, similar to last year. Thank you, Anna, that's really helpful. Um, do we have any more questions for Anna specifically or just any general questions from the volunteers before we finish the webinar? Can I ask about the disease in plain trees? Yeah, please do. Yeah, um, my name's Liz, I'm in um, Northamptonshire. Does it kill the trees, or is it, um, well, not really? <laughs> okay, no, it doesn't kill the tree. Uh, yeah. What it does, it will kill the, the shoots, and okay. badly affected trees, they will have, uh, you will see them, and you will have a lot of uh, bunches of brown leaves mm -hmm. hanging on the tree, but mm -hmm. you will see that it's only the shoots. It doesn't kill the branches. Uh, it may kill some twigs, but no big branches and because it can affect the, the twigs and cause cankers, and that is what makes the, the twig uh, blight, obviously. But it doesn't kill the tree. Right, oh, that's good. Right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Any more general questions? Okay, everybody, I think we're going to close today. So thanks for everybody's time today. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, there will be a webinar in about a month's time, and we look forward to hearing from you then. Thanks very much for your time now. Bye.